you a Jew? Yeah. Oh, you're a good luck. They just like my face, I you're think. You're good luck. No, yeah. Good evening. Uh, visitors, we would like to welcome those uh, who are with us, and we want to invite you to stay and worship with us as often as you possibly can. Uh, those who are ill and needing our prayers, uh, we have Margaret Breedlove, who has been admitted to Greenview and will likely go to therapy from there after evaluation. Ross Johnson is in hospice care on Scottsville Road. Helen Oakley is in the Greenwood Nursing Center, room 331, and today is her 96th birthday. Uh, we call to your attention these items of interest. If you would like to ride the bus from the building to the ladies' retreat, this Friday and Saturday night, contact Linda Matthews. It'll be going both ways. Uh, there are a few pictorial directors on the table in the NPR for anyone who would like to have a hard copy. More will be printed each week as needed. Uh, Lad's money is due to Kelly and, Harold's Nick, Kelly and Harold Nix as soon as possible, and food money is due to Bailey and Nick Debris as soon as possible. Uh, other announcements can be found in the bulletin room, in, on the bulletin board and the website. Uh, please bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for us being able to all gather here together and learn more about you and for the lessons that have been prepared tonight. Uh, please be with us as we go throughout this week. God, guard, and direct us and help us to make the best decisions that we can and to remember who we are as Christians. Uh, please be with all those who are sick and shut in right now and help them to get better. Be with Margaret Breedlove, and Ross Johnson, and Helen Oakley. Uh, and please be with them as they go throughout this, the rest of this week. In your son's name, amen. The first song tonight is A Wonderful Savior. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses of this. <clears throat> A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows
So tonight's lesson is going to, you know, the Bible talks a lot about <clears throat> those who are blessed, who do not, who have not seen but still believe. So we're going to talk tonight about a couple of extraordinary individuals of many that are in the Bible. Now, I didn't put all of Joshua 2, 1 through 11 on this page, um, but I'm going to read most of it, and, and the high points are on this page. So if you want to turn to Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> so this is, you know, referencing them coming into the land of Canaan, and they're going to start taking cities, and Jericho was one of the first they came to. So it says, Joshua, son of Nun, sent two spies out from Shittim secretly and instructed them, find out what you can about the land, especially Jericho. They stopped at the house of a prostitute named Rahab and spent the night there. The king of Jericho heard about it, received this report. He said, note well, Israelite men have come here tonight to spy on the land. So the king of Jer Jericho sent this order to Rahab. Turn over the men who came to you, the ones who came to your house, for they have come to spy on the whole land. But the woman hid the two men and replied, Yes, these men were clients of mine, but I don't know where they came from. When it was time to shut the city gate, the men left. I don't know where they were heading. Chased after them quickly, and you might catch them. Now she had taken them up to the roof and had hid them in stalks of flax she had spread out on the roof. So they went and searched for them, of course, didn't find them. Now jumping down to eight. Now before the spies went to sleep, Rahab went up to the roof. She said to the men, I know the Lord is handing this land over to you. We are absolutely terrified of you, and all who live in the land are cringing before you. For we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you, and when you left Egypt, and how you annihilated the two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og, on the other side of the Jordan. When we heard the news, we lost our courage, and no one could even breathe for fear of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. So now promise with an oath in the Lord's name, because I have shown allegiance to you, you will show allegiance to my family. <clears throat> so... Looking into this, you know, it always kind of bothered me that they called her a prostitute. But guess what? She was a prostitute. All, all the research and everybody that's looked into it said she was either a temple prostitute um, because, you know, all the way up uh, into Roman and Greek times, um, that's how they would bring money into their temples, is some of them would have, they were basically whorehouses, okay? And different women would take turns um, working at the temple to bring money into the temple. So they figured she was either one of those or she was a private prostitute, but she was a prostitute. Um, she obviously was more than that. She was a, probably a very smart businesswoman. Uh, we know when, it's, when they said, bring your family into your house, she didn't have a husband, she didn't have children, she had a father, brothers, and, and other family members, but she didn't have any children. She hid them on flax on her roof. So flax is used to make linen. So she was probably either doing that as an intermediary and would sell it to the cloth makers. And then she had an inn where people would come and eat or stay. So she was a, she was a pretty savvy businesswoman. Think about how she described, you know, it sounded like a horror movie when the big monsters getting ready to come into your house, they were cringing in fear and how they didn't want to breathe. They were afraid that the Israelites would hear them. That's how terrified they were. But she made a decision. Out of all these other people in Jericho, she made a decision to follow God. She had heard about it. She hadn't seen it. She had heard about it. Kind of like hearing a tornado far off coming toward your house. So of course you go cringe in fear. That's what they were doing. But she didn't just cringe in fear. She was going to take action. And she did. And she saved her parents, her brothers and sisters, and her whole household. That's why she's mentioned in the Bible more than once. Because she was one of those extraordinary people that believed in God from afar. Just by hearing. 
Now let's go to the next amazing person, Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, 8 through 18. And I suggest, I would really want you to reread this. If you want to hear them at one of the most beautiful declarations of love and loyalty of one person for another, read Naomi's declaration, Ruth's declaration to Naomi. It is, it will bring tears to your eyes. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home when the Lord May the Lord show you kindness, and you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Naomi, her husband, and two sons had went off to Moab because there was a famine. And so they went off there to survive. But during that time, Naomi's husband died and both of her sons died. And so she was going to go home, and she told the girls to go back to their family in Moab. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her, and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even, in, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Orpah chose to go back to her people and her gods. What had Ruth seen? She had married into this Jewish family, saw her father-in-law die, saw her husband die, saw her Orpah's husband die. Most people would have said, I don't think I want to follow this God based on just circumstances. But she saw the God of heaven through Naomi. She saw God through Naomi. And I'm sure the characters of her father-in-law and her own husband. And she was not going to let go was not going to let go. Last one, Matthew chapter 1, 5 and 6. This is a part of the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. These two women grabbed a hold of the unseen God. And they were a part of Jesus. They were a part of that genealogy. And we are all blessed for that. So I really want you to think about these wonderful women and see the unseen and hold on to it and never let go. If you haven't done that yet, please come tonight and do it. Oh, do not let the word depart and close thine eyes against the light. Poor sinner, harden not thy heart. Be saved, oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight wilt thou be saved? Then why not tonight? Tomorrow 
sun may never rise. To bless thy long deluded sight. This is the time, oh, then be wise. Be saved, oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Then why not tonight? Our blessed Lord refuses none who would to him their souls unite. Believe, obey, the work is done. Be saved, oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Then why not tonight? You're dismissed to classes. It's just loud. There we go.
Hello. As you're going, this is kind of a two-parter. Part number one bleeds into part number two. Some of you are sitting up closer. How about that? It's amazing. Um, here are some things right here just to kind of hit some high points, and we'll, we'll discuss them as, uh, as we need. But uh, here we go. Number one, most successful Bible studies begin with the establishment of the teacher's personal credibility. Now, that, that shouldn't sound odd. I mean, you would expect that people would be more drawn to study with somebody who had personal credibility, that uh, they would have some confidence in because they had shown themselves to be a reliable Christian person. And uh, so we invest ourselves in talking when we invest ourselves in living. And our lives uh, give us opportunities to speak to people or maybe even be asked questions about them. Conversational knowledge with Jesus at the wheel of a disciple's heart is the end game because we're talking about when evangelism leaves the building, the salt leaves the shaker, and Jesus takes the wheel. So uh, in 1 Peter 3.15, where we sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts so we can answer people who ask us concerning the hope that lies within us, I'm going to, even though we're spread out, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to ask questions. You may try to answer them. I may not hear you, but whatever. Why? What is conversational knowledge? Okay, or inside your heart. Uh, either way, it kind of describes it. It's, it's not like you're tied to something. You can just talk about it. And, and we do that with any number of things through the course of the day that we are interested in with other people. Uh, sports is, is one of them. Uh, but there are any number of politics. Oh, man. But uh, people just, uh, they usually don't have notes with them. They can just talk about it because it's something that they know something about that they can talk about. Now, they might want to go to things to get a more accurate knowledge. They might be asked questions that they don't know the answer to. But generally speaking, when we go out through the course of the day, we just talk to people, right? About things that we know something about. We're able to be guides to searching souls, helping them to discover what Scripture adds up to, okay? Scripture adds up to conclusions, okay? Uh, how many of us, if we weren't alive back then, through the magic of television, have been brought into rawhide with the young Clint Eastwood. Don't be ashamed. It was a clean show. What did, what did he and Rowdy, uh, the, the head guy, who, who, what were they doing? They were doing something with cattle. What were they doing with them? Hmm? Did they guide them? No. They didn't guide them. What did they do? What do they call those people on the horses? Drovers. Cowboy, cowboy drovers. Okay, I should have never started this. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but, we'll get there. We'll get there. They are cowboys. And, and, uh, but they have cattle drives, right? Because you don't say, come on, you cows. Uh, you, you, you urge them along. Now, that's, what we're, that's not what we want to do when we have a Bible study. We don't want to drive people. We want to be drovers. We want to guide them. Now, classic example of this is the Ethiopian. This is where I'm getting this. And uh, God, the Spirit, gets him up to the chariot of the Ethiopian Philip. And he's reading from a scroll that has our Isaiah 53 there. And so he asks the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? That's a good question. And he, he is a bit perplexed. He wants to know, what is this? Is he talking about himself? Isaiah talking about himself? The, uh, or is he talking about somebody else? He, he said, how, how can I come to an answer on this unless somebody guide me? So what does Philip do? All right, good, good, Rhonda. He guides him. Now, interestingly enough, we don't have the conversation, but we know what happens after the conversation at some point, because he starts where he is and preaches to him what? 
Jesus. Because that's what we're all trying to do, wherever we are, is preach Jesus. And so they're driving along, he's been teaching Jesus, and he sees some water. Something from Isaiah 53 about Jesus got to baptism, right? Okay, so what does, what does he say? Well, here's some water. How's about me getting baptized? So he did the math. He put it together. He saw that that was the conclusion of where he started in Isaiah and started preaching to him Jesus. There's something about preaching Jesus includes baptism, okay? So that's what we want. We want people to discover. I would rather them discover the answer than tell it to them. I, I'm not beyond telling it to them, but I would much rather them seeing it, having one of those, you know, those aha moments where I see that. I, I, one of my ones that I can remember the most vividly. Uh, I've been in a, toward the end of a seven year study over at Oak Ridge where all those scientists were. And I'd go over there in the dark of night and I'd have to give passwords at the gate and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and I'd meet with, oh, about 12 or 15 people. And this one guy's a deacon in the, in the huge church down the road from us at Carnes. Carnes was pretty big, but these people were huge. They had ball fields and gyms and, and everything. And uh, he's a great guy. And so we're, we're studying and, and I'm leading the study. And so uh, I asked the question, I just ask. I just up and ask it. When was Paul saved? Can you guess what he might have said? Road to Damascus? Road to Damascus. He said that. So you know what I had him do? I had him read. I had him read where Paul is going along the road to Damascus. And what happens? Jesus appears. I had this in a post the other day because I think it's, we can have presuppositions and really be surprised that we're wrong. Because here he's thinking Jesus is a blasphemer and he, he hits the deck and he says, who are you? And he says, well, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And it's got to be, oh man. So he tells him to go on to Damascus and he's going to get somebody up with him. And uh, so he, he goes there and, he, and, and my man, uh, David is his first name. He's uh, He's reading along, he's reading along, and he's, got, he's gotten to Damascus, and he's getting way out nice there. And, um, and, and what does he say? And now, why do you tarry, delay? What does hinder you? And, and Paul knew what Christians did. He's not ignorant of that. He's been dealing with them, putting them in jail and everything else. He knows very well what they're teaching and what they're preaching. So he knows what you do if you come to conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You get baptized for the mission of your sins. Now, he says, arise and be baptized and what? Wait a minute. He got, he got forgiven on the road to Damascus. No, wait a minute. It, 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 his eyes get real big. He's, and he says... He couldn't have gotten saved on the road to Damascus. Well, of course not, because he wouldn't have said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, would he? If they'd already been taken care of. So that was his, he added it up. He said, and he said, I've read that verse a hundred times, and I've never seen that before. Which I thought was also interesting. Because I think that can happen to anybody. That can happen to us. You ever had that happen to you? Where you're reading along one day and you see something you hadn't seen. You've read that verse 50 times. Okay. The, the pieces come together. It adds up to something you haven't seen it add up to before. Which is one of the amazing things about the scripture. And you have your aha moment. So that's what we want people to do. Because let's go into the deep realms of education. It has been proven that if you want somebody to learn something and never forget it, if they discover it themselves, they will remember it as long as they're able to remember. So it would make sense, would it not? Now, uh, we had, I went to a really large high school, it was about 25, 2600 people, and we had giant classes, okay? There were one of them in the basement at Thurl High School, and, and the guy we called Taco Joe, because he ran a taco place uh, to help make more money than he got for being a teacher. 
And, and here's what Joe did. Joe would open up his book, this exciting world history book, and he would commence to read till the bell rang. We loved it. Sometimes when the bell would ring, we'd say, Joe, read some more to us. We just can't get enough of this. But he'd tear himself away, he had other classes to teach, and off he went. How much of that did we take out of the room with us? Very little. But we had teachers that taught so that you would discover it. And you felt a sense of accomplishment because you're part of the process. You're just not there and later being asked to, pardon the expression, regurgitate on a piece of paper. You're there to share what you have learned yourself by putting the information together. And, and that's, what, that's what we're trying to do when we talk to people about the Bible. We want them to have that because that's the best way they can learn that will help them to remember things forever. And once they get into that pattern, you keep adding stuff to it and making other discoveries and boom, 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 boom. Off it goes. So we want to get people to enjoy their Bible study. Okay. I would rather you read through the Bible in a year than not. But I'd a whole lot rather you do some other things with your Bible. I would a lot rather you study it. I'd a lot rather you put the pieces together and come up to a conclusion because that's what it's there for. What does Jesus do on the Sermon on the Mount? You remember he read 18 chapters out of Jeremiah. You remember that? No, he didn't. What did he do? He gives them bits and pieces from the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of that that's in there, if you know your Old Testament well, like the Beatitudes, they're coming right out of the Old Testament. There's not a thing in the Sermon on the Mount that isn't in the Old Testament. And these are people that know the Old Testament, but they didn't know how to put it together and come up with a conclusion. They've been listening to the Pharisees who've messed everything up. And so Jesus is basically saying, here's what you guys have been hearing. Let me put it together for you and show you what it means. And what, what was their reaction after he got finished with that sermon? Did they do this? Oh, it's overhead. Never heard anything like that before. Why did he just tell us what the Pharisees tell us? No. What, what, did, what did conclude chapter 7? What happens? What does he do? What do they do? The crowd. They were amazed. Why? He's not teaching them like they're the scribes and the Pharisees. He's teaching them as one having authority. He knows what he's talking about. He knows how the pieces fit together. He knows how to make the Bible come alive. They're listening to telling a bunch of Pharisees saying, you do this, you don't do that, you do this, you don't do that, you do this, you don't do that. That's really exciting, isn't it? And Jesus is saying, let me give you the key to unlocking this for yourselves to see what God's really after. And he's not just after some external rules and regulations so you will have those he's after your life and your heart and he wants you to think that way so you'll do that way and that's exciting that's exciting we need to start where people where we find people we hear that a lot but and therefore understand that no two people are alike have you ever noticed that no two people are alike have you noticed that you have do you like to be part of a one-size-fits-all situation? Why? Because the size doesn't fit you. You ever gotten any of those athletic socks? You know, size 8 to 12 or something crazy like that? In other words, they don't fit hardly anybody. You can get them on your feet, and if you put your shoes on over them, they probably won't fall off. But, but that's about it. Uh, I finally bought small athletic socks. I have a narrow foot. And the heel of my sock was up around my calf. Uh, <laughs> that little, you know, gray part is like, what's it doing up there? Uh, so I finally got some that's, that my, the gray part, I'm a shoe. it's just so cool. They fit so much better. So that's where the sock needed to start with me because that's where I was, Okay. So we enjoy people starting where we are because we're unique. We want them to respect us for, our, for ourselves. And did Jesus ever start the same place with any two people? This is where you all say no. Very good. You're coming along. Uh, did he always want to go to the same place with them? Yes. Wanted to go to God. But they're all at a different place, and they're going to be with God. So what does he do? 
He starts where they are. We hear that a lot when we talk about in the book of Acts, people get different answers when they ask, what do we need to do to be saved? Because there are different places, and they take them where they are in that. We talked about that a little bit last week. So, uh, okay, here's where I give my qualified disclaimer. I used to have to tell my students all the time what I wasn't saying, because they'd accuse me of saying stuff that I wasn't saying. So here's what I'm not saying. You got to start somewhere, right? And to be able to do what we're talking about takes a little time. It shouldn't take forever, but it takes a little time. You don't just pop up out of the waters and start doing this. Most people wouldn't be able to. But neither does it take forever in a day. It's, it's doable because we learn to do stuff. We learn to go out and talk to people where they are and get out in life, and we do that all the time. We don't think a thing in the world about it. Why do we do that? Why do we learn to talk to people where they are about the things we want to talk about? Because we want to talk about them, and we want to talk about them to them in a way that they'll appreciate and we can have a conversation, right? If football means that to us, or sometimes basketball, uh, then um, why not this? Well, it should. So, uh, I realize when you first start out, you, you, you might need some help, and you might need something that kind of starts the same place, and you do all that. And I'm not, I'm not here to say, never do that. It's the devil's work. But I am going to say, that's not where God wants us to wind up, because where does he want us to wind up? What's the end game? Remember that? First Peter 3.15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart so that you'll be able to give an answer, a reason, response, and explanation to those who ask you concerning the hope that lies within you, yet with meekness and with fear or reverence. Okay? That's just what the Bible says. That's why we're talking about this. Um, don't be afraid. Because there's a certain fear in Bible talk that isn't in basketball talk, Right? I mean, it's just got more of an edge to it. I understand that, and I don't want to minimize that. You know how to talk, but there's more of an edge to it this way. Don't be afraid to ask sincere, honest questions that get to the heart of what matters most, i.e., what the people we are talking to personally believe, because I need to know what you believe if I'm going to talk to you about stuff. An example is, Jesus has gotten to the point in his ministry where his miracles are basically going to stop because they've done what, what they're supposed to do. And so he says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Because there's been enough there to where anybody who's paid the least bit of attention understands, well, this must be the son of God. He couldn't do this kind of stuff. Even some of the Pharisees are coming to that conclusion. And then they give him some answers. Well, you know, there's John the Baptist and there's... Jeremiah, because there was a legend among the Jews that since Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, when the Messiah came, he'd get to come back so he could smile. He didn't. Or one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, and this is it, this is what we're talking about. Who do you say that I am? Because at the end of the day, it didn't matter what anybody else said. He's not talking to anybody else. He was talking to them. And he said, what do you think? How do you see this? And Simon Peter spoke up, but they all felt the same way because they'd all been seeing the same things. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. They had seen things on earth that had a heavenly origin that added up to this man has to be the Messiah. Okay? And so he wanted to know, what do you think about this? And they tell him, and he says, that's good, because I'm going to build the church on that foundation. So we want to find out where are you and ask sincere questions with people. It's okay. You might want to ask, well, how do you see baptism? I mean, we, well, how do you see it? Because it may be kind of, sometimes people wiggle around in Bible studies, they're afraid to commit. Just ask them. It's okay. And encourage them to ask you. It's okay. And when they ask you, answer them. Because if we can't have an honest conversation, there's no sense having one in the first place, right? Okay. Um, allow the mind of Christ to naturally become part of our conversation with others. This is another something that we've said before, which is another education thing. You repeat in another way, in other words. So that's what we're doing here. Um, Philippians 2.5, what does it say? Have this, it depends on your translation. Most of them will say, mind 
got a nasty attitude. It's probably a better attitude, but it's the same thing. Six one half does the other. In you that was also in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. This is another part of that. We're putting some parts together. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? That's an Old Testament quotation. But we got more now. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, if we didn't have the mind of Christ, we couldn't have the mind of Christ in us, could we? No. So, how, who gave us the mind of Christ? The Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. He lets us know who Jesus is so that can be in us. Now, what does it look like when you do it? Let's put another piece into this puzzle. Let's go to Galatians 2.20. Here's a person who understood that and did it and has it. I've been crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, here we go. Have this mind in you. We have that mind. Paul acquired that mind so that he replaced his mind with that mind so he would think like Jesus rather than himself. Now, he's had a drastic change of thinking because before he met Jesus, he was wanting to kill Christians. So, something's gone on. He's got a different way of thinking. He's repented. He's got a new mind. And the repented isn't just, well, we change any way we want to. We change from who we are to who he is. That's what repentance is. We are potentially evangelistic even we do not teach a Bible study. Good gracious alive. I guess if you were asleep, you aren't now. Let me read that again. <laughs> we are potentially evangelistic even when we do not teach a Bible study. How many, and this, this, is a, this is not a trick question, but as we think of Bible study, as we think of Bible study, how many of those do we see Jesus doing? As we think of it. What does he do? He talks to people, doesn't he? And we, we already said he never talks to any two people exactly the same way because they're not the same people. But he always talks to them to get them to the same place because the goal is to have a relationship with God. So, um, we are potentially teaching when we're not having a formal Bible study. Jesus rarely had what we would call and what looks to us like a formal Bible study. I think there's a message there somewhere. Jesus, when dealing with individuals and small groups, had conversations with them. We talked about interaction. And I've got a few of them, but they're all over the place, right? John 3, who's he having an interaction with there? Starts with an N. Nicodemus. Are they talking? Is he teaching? Chapter 4, who's he talking to? Woman at the well. Could you have two people any more different? It would be hard to find two people any more different than that. You got one guy up here as a Jew, another person who's down here is a Samaritan. And he talks to her, and they, he wants both of them to be saved. But they're not the same people. So he talks to them individually, based on who they are. Which is, when we think about it, because we do it when we don't think about it, how we talk to people anyway. You don't talk to your Aunt Marge like you do your Uncle Fred. Why? Because they're not the same person. You don't talk to your mama like your daddy. Why not? Because they're not the same person. If we talk to everybody exactly the same, it's going to get a little weird and people are not going to want to talk to us. Um, when you're dating somebody, do you talk to that person that you're with like you talked to the person you dated last week? I hope not. That would be the end of that real quick. So, these are things we all know. This is not mysterious stuff. This is just how... Uh, life works. We cannot become proficient teachers if we do not practice communicating to others the things we want to teach well. Hebrews 5, uh, 14. 
Uh, it starts with verse 12, well, the thought does. When by reason of time, what? You ought to be teachers. Now, James talks about teachers in the, like the professionals, the rabbis, and everybody's not supposed to be that kind of teacher, but everybody's supposed to be a teacher. Everybody's supposed to be a teacher, okay? Let's say that again, even if you didn't say it. Everybody's supposed to be a teacher by reason of time. Some people will be better teachers than others, of course. But everybody's supposed to be a teacher. 1 Peter 3.15 isn't written to a subset of Christians. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Well, how many of us need to do that, Peter? All of you. So that you'll be able to give an answer to those who ask concerning the hope that lies within you. How many of those people are we supposed to give an answer to? Whoever gives you a question about it. Is that straightforward enough? Some will do it better than others. Of course they will. But you know what? Well, I've got another point coming out here. I don't want to, don't want to spoil my other point. Um, here it is. Didn't have to wait long. Often illiterate, common people were able to turn the world upside down. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 29. How many big wigs and hot shots and wealthy people and movers and shakers were converted to the Corinthian church? What kind of people were? Such were some of you. Remember that in chapter 6? All the yahoos and degenerates that Corinth had, some of those were converted. So when, when Paul goes and he comes to town, these people are, oh, why are they upset? Why are they worried? Why are they concerned? Those people who were turning the world upside down, they're here. Well, Paul wasn't everywhere all the time. Regular folks were. His evangelistic strategy was this. It's very simple. We might want to try it sometime just for fun. Here's what he did. He goes to a place, and now he does missionary journeys. You named it. You got the cities right? Okay. He goes to a place. What does he do? He goes to synagogue. There's synagogue most of the time there are. He taught, teaches to the God-fearers, the Gentiles who were God-fearers who, who associated with the Jews, right? And what does he do? He gets as many of them as he can, and he baptizes them, right? And that's the church. He stays with them and teaches them a while, and then he goes on to another one. What are those people supposed to do that he leaves behind? Why well, they're supposed to tune him in on Sundays on the radio. No. What are they supposed to do? Take care of business. Okay. Uh, D-Day is on, well, there are a series of these things they call beaches, right? There's different names for them, and there's Gold Beach and Omaha Beach and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and different people land on different beaches, you know, different groups do that. And what are they supposed to do when they get on the beach? They're supposed to do something. They're not supposed to stay there. They've got to fight through the Germans and the artillery and, and all this kind of stuff, machine guns. But what are, they, what are they trying to establish on the beach, the, the respective beaches? Beach heads. Why are they doing that? Because if they don't have a controlled area, they can't stage into France. Well, the church can't stage into wherever if they don't have a beachhead, if they don't have an established area. Guess what that established area is called? The church. So that's God's plan of evangelism. Church established, they take care of their business. Why? Because the plan is for them to become disciples, right? Right? And when you become disciples, you can take care of business. When by reason of time you ought to be able to, well, you're able to because you took advantage of that. We've observed, and to me it's kind of astounding, the people that are baptized in Acts 2, by, by the time they're distributed out in Acts 8 and 9, through persecution, they go everywhere doing what? The longest any of them would have been Christians was two years. What would happen if the average two-year-old Christian got dispersed because of persecution and had to run over to Mississippi or something? Are they going to start preaching the word, do you think, under normal circumstances? No, they don't. They don't. They're supposed to. That's part of the church. That's part of how Jesus built the church. That's how Paul did church. And we ought to do it the same way. We ought to have expectations. Not heavy-handed expectations, but reasonable expectations that by reason of time, people will become disciples. And they can talk to people about Jesus. There are all kinds of things within two years' period of time we can talk to people about that we love. Right? 
We get onto a whatever, some kind of thing that's a hobby or a what, and in a couple of years, man, we're talking about it all over the place. In fact, if somebody drops a hat, we'll talk about it. And if they don't, we'll drop the hat. That's God's plan. If we want to talk about evangelism, we ought to at least talk about it the way God does it. And that's the way he does it. That's the way he wants us to do it. More people, by far, are converted through friends and family. You listening? You got friends and family, don't you? So do I. Than by preachers or through church assemblies. They've, some years ago, four or five different groups decided to see, you know, how, what's the main cause of somebody being baptized? And they ranked them. Preachers came in between 1.5 and 2%. Assemblies were 1%. 80 to 85% were friends and family. What does that tell you? It's not happening in here. I like in here. I get worried sometimes when people don't come in here when I think they should. But this Christianity isn't an in here religion. It involves in here. We ought to be in here when we ought to be in here. That's just part of the deal. We're supposed to promote a love and good deeds among each other and, and all that kind of thing. We're supposed to meet around the Lord's table and other things. We're supposed to do that as a family and fellowship. Yes, yes, yes. But the business happens out there. And statistics prove that's where it happens. You and me influence somebody we know. Who will have the best influence with somebody we know, a stranger or us? I hope us. I will not go into detail so you cannot figure out what this is, but in a conversation I had recently involving men who are the shepherds of this congregation, we were talking about certain people who didn't come here anymore, hadn't been here for years, and they were talking about a particular person that was closer to them than anybody else who hadn't been able to have any influence on them, and one of those elders who happens to be in this room at this very moment said, if they don't have influence with them, what, what chance do we have? And that's dead on right. That's dead on right. So uh, we need to, to broker that as, as much as we can. What time is it? I can never see that thing. I mean, how much do we have? Hold up fingers. Maybe we, you don't have enough fingers. You do have enough fingers. Five minutes? Good job. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to go to the part two, transition. You, you need transitions. We need to learn how to deal with commonly asked questions. There are commonly asked questions. I know, once you think you've heard them all, you hear one you never heard before. That's just part of the deal. As a teacher, I taught for 30 years at Easton, and every time I thought I'd heard it 100 times, somebody comes up and asks a question I never even dreamed existed. And they wanted an answer. We need to know how to deal with the commonly asked questions. That'll take about a huge percentage of what we're going to deal with how to avoid the emotional roadblocks that are often associated with them. Uh, number one, we'll start to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, and we've got several of them. What about people who have never heard the gospel? You ever heard that? You ever wondered about that? Sure you have. What about them? Well, for here's, here's, here's what we know. The Bible teaches that men are lost because they're in their sins. They're not lost because they don't hear the gospel, right? That didn't lose them because they didn't hear it. They were lost because they were sinners. Thus, the preaching of the gospel is for men who are lost. People are not lost because they do not hear. They are lost because they sin. This is all we can say according to the scriptures. God will do whatever is right, even though we may not understand everything, he'll do it. Our job is to understand what we've been told, that's all we know, and that's what we're supposed to do. If that's all there is to it, that's all there is to it. If there's more, it's his business, and I don't care. But I do care about what he's asked me to do. Who remembers Will Rogers? Hopefully none of you do. But who, who knows who he is? He used to do a little rope thing. He was a, uh, this, you know, had these little sayings, and he was like a homespun guy. And one of the things he said, all I know is what I read in the papers. Now, that was a sarcastic statement, because papers then and now. In fact, uh, I read the other day that C.S. Lewis wouldn't read newspapers because he was the sorriest source of history you could ever want to read. And it's, I don't know what he'd say now. It hadn't gotten any better. 
But uh, all I know is what I read in the Bible. If there is more, I don't know it. It's not my business to know it, and God doesn't want me to worry about it. It's above my pay grade, and I got enough to worry about with what I can't understand. I had an aunt who I tried to encourage to study the Bible. Here's what she said. People give strange answers, you know, sometimes to avoid the Bible. And she, here's what she said. She seriously said this. I'm afraid of what I'll find in there. You know what? It was in there, whether she found it or not. Like going to see the doc here. I go yesterday. And I could have stayed home and said, you know, he's liable to find something horrible. Guess what? It wasn't that bad. Well, it, it went okay. I, I almost got killed going over there by, uh, by semi-slinging a tire, but uh, after I pulled myself together and got my blood pressure down where they could read it, I, uh, I went on about my business. And at the time before that, I went, my, my, old, my youngest son was having a life crisis while I was in the parking lot. And I told him, one of these days, I'm going to come to your establishment, and I'm going to be calm. <laughs> so we'll see. July, I think, is the next time I get a chance to do that. Uh, but that said, it, it, nothing I don't read in here isn't true. It's all true. And so... Uh, I don't know what might be in there that God hadn't told me. Secret things belong to who? God. I, you know why I don't know what they are? Because they're secret. And you know what? That doesn't mean that it's going to be any different from what I know. It doesn't mean that. But all I know is what I know, and that's all I can tell you, and that's all you can act on. That's it. So say, what about the people who've never heard? They've never heard, and they were sinners, and they needed the gospel. That I know. That's all I need to know. Okay, we got what, 30 seconds? Do you believe that there are Christians in all denominations? That'd be a good little Yvonne, wouldn't it? Have you heard that? Okay. Let's let's save that for next time. Thank you.